1960 and 2020, 60 years, the idea of what's obscene has certainly shifted. Right? It reflects in the films as well. Lady Chatterley's Lover has been made into film several times. There was a, well, I won't say famous, but certainly quite well-known version in, um, when was this, 19, trying to find the dates. Ah, yes, 1981. 1981. Um, starring Sylvia Crystal and Nicholas Quay. It was actually shown in Singapore with many cuts. And in that time, when in the 1980s, the fact that it was shown at all was sensational. Uh, very explicit. Nudity, um, full frontal nudity. Don't go, don't all go rush out and get it, all right? But yeah, anyway, you're under 21, don't, don't watch this. It's not available in Singapore. But if you go to the UK and you subscribe to Netflix, it's available. It's not even restricted. It's freely available. The Sylvia Crystal Nicholas Clay version. Um, a more recent version was made in the just a couple of years ago by BBC. Lady Chatterley's Lover. They took out all the sex. They, it was just basically a social commentary thing. Um, working class people and toss. You compare that with Murakami's Murakami's um, book. It was made into a film. This was, let me just check that, 2010, about a decade ago, the director was Chan An Hang, a Korean, uh, sorry, not Korean, Vietnamese person. And strangely, if you watch the film, you'll see that the sex is far less, far less um, salient than in the book. And Midori in the film comes off as far less promiscuous than in the book. So you have a very interesting, um, you have a very interesting phenomenon where there has been a change in, cul in cultural value, sorry, in societal acceptance of things like nudity between the 1960s and the new millennium. But you also see a cultural difference between Asian and Western. And this is interesting. You know, if you watch, for example, say, uh, you might watch Korean, you know, Korean stuff. I don't watch it myself. My wife watches it. I sit there next to her. It's like getting side smoke from, from the smoker, right? But it's still a big deal when they go dating. If you watch Western stuff. They expect sex the first time, right? How does this actually impact on criminal law? As a result of the pride that nations have um, in their airlines, what has happened for many countries around the world is that they severely protect uh, their national airlines from competition. So what happens as a result is that, if you look at the map of the world here, right, um, Singapore Airlines flies from Singapore to China, and you will realize this in the aviation law course if you take it, that uh, that aeroplane that flies you from Singapore to Beijing has to come back. It cannot fly from Beijing to San Francisco across the Pacific Ocean, right? Simply because if it were allowed to fly between Beijing and San Francisco, Singapore Airlines would then be posing competition to the Chinese and the American airlines that fly that route. So because of this protectionism, what happens is that the plane has to come back to Singapore. And as a result, the aviation industry is one of the very few in the world which actually has restrictions on its markets. So the markets are well-defined. The markets are invariably routes that you can fly only from your home base. And you cannot put a plane, say, in India and fly between India and the UK. Because again, that would be posing competition to the local airlines. So the protectionism that uh, you see from, from this industry is quite unlike any other industry um, uh, around the world. These are the voyages of international space law. And if you're a geek like me, you'd know that comes from Star Trek. So 
Um, it's always lovely to have um, you know some some kind of reference point. But when people think about space law, what do they think about? They think about this Thor, Ragnarok, or Solo. You know, big guns, a lot of people in outer space. Very cool people, I must say. Or the Avengers. We of course have terrifying people, like uh, you know, in the Alien Six film collection. But we also have lovely ET. Um, you know, and ET phones home the whole time. So that's what we see. We also look at the beautiful um, movies that we have, Hidden Figures, Apollo 13, First Man, 2001, A Space Odyssey, really a classic. And of course, all the Star Wars and Star Trek movies, and my personal favorite, Wall-E. Uh, when we're talking about all of these movies and we keep going on, we see so many different interpretations. It's always sci-fi and fantasy, but in space law, what do we talk about? Basically, things that people keep getting wrong. So I'm not going to spoil The Martian for you, but there is one line in the movie that Matt Damon had to say in The Martian, and he gets space law wrong. He gets the line right, but the space law is wrong in that line. I won't spoil it for you, but go listen to Matt, uh, Matt Watney, I think his name is, Matt Watney's Space Pirate, completely wrong, and come to the course to find out why it is wrong. Now, when we speak about space and the final frontier, this is actually what we're speaking of. And what you're looking at in the background is the view from the cupola of the International Space Station. In the background, our planet. And this is what we're doing in space, in the space industry, in space law. We are sending things outside of the envelope of our planet, and they do two things. They go out, but they look back. And that's why space is the final frontier. We break through the envelope of our planet and look back upon it. Why is this so special? For me, I like to think that in international space law, it justifies all of public international law. When you look at our planet, you see the one habitat that we have, the only one that we know can sustain human life. You see everyone who's ever lived, whom everyone whom you love, everyone they have ever loved, all on one little dot that's suspended on a sunbeam and that's what we are and that's why space law is so tremendous for me and i hope for all of you as well our starting point is a look at the asset side of the balance sheet typically a bank lends to the real industry to households and therefore a big part of its assets consist of loans. Loans come with typical risks, one of which is the credit risk. The risk that the borrower of these loans might default with his or her obligation to pay back the loan. Hence, our first risk type is the credit risk. The bank might not get the money back. At the same time, however, might be exposed to repayment obligations on the liability side of its balance sheet. The liability side of the balance sheet looks, we know that already, like this. It's a mix of equity and of debt. So consider the case of RVJ. Two rules. Rule one says it's an offense to indecently touch a girl under 16, even if such touching, touch, such touching was consensual. Rule two, another rule, makes it an offense to have consensual sex with a girl under 16. Now, the interesting thing is that rule two, but not rule one, has a 12-month time bar. 12-month time bar means you can only prosecute somebody under rule two for consensual sex with a girl under 16, i.e. underage sex. You can only prosecute someone for underage sex under rule two if you charge the person within 12 months of the alleged consensual sex. Okay? You can only charge the guy, you can only charge him under rule two if you do so within 12 months of the, the, the alleged misconduct. So what happened in this case is that the 12 months was up, right? It was far, far, far beyond 12 months. So rule two could not apply. The prosecution could not charge this person under rule two because 12, more than 12 months had passed. 
So the prosecution said, let's charge the guy under Rule 1 because Rule 1 covers the same behavior. It covers, it covers indecent touching of a girl under 16, even if consensual. And surely if the, the accused had consensual sex with an underage girl, that involves indecent, indecent touching. So they tried to, so the prosecution charged this guy under Rule 1 and the court said, no. Okay, the court held, you can't. Um, you can't bypass the 12 month requirement under rule two by, by prosecuting under rule one. So what is the, what's the lesson here? Well, the lesson here is that there are rules in a statute that may overlap, right? Different rules may apply or multiple rules may apply to the same factual scenario. And somebody who drafts the rule uh, must be cognizant of how the various provisions in the same statute interact and how conflicts between the two statutes or the two rules um, can be resolved. 